When sun rays crown thy pine clad hills and summer spreads her hand, when silver voices tune thy rills, we love thee smiling now. Welcome to part two of our presentation Newfoundland Surface Mail Stamps. 1856 to 1947. In this part, we'll begin with the Cabot issue of 1897 and continue through to the end of the series in 1947. In the concluding moments, we'll touch on the provisional issues, including bisects and the overprints that change the stamp's value or use. The year 1897 was doubly special for Newfoundlanders. It was not only the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, which was celebrated all over the British Empire, it was also the 400th anniversary of the discovery of Newfoundland by John Cabot in 1897. To mark the double anniversary, the Newfoundland government issued a set of no fewer than 14 stamps, including six new values. There were four design themes, Victoria, historical aspects of Cabot and his voyage, the island's industries like sealing, mining, and logging, and sporting attractions like salmon fishing shown here. The Cabot issue was produced by the American Banknote Company and all values were printed only once. It has been said that Cabot ship Matthew on the Tencent is the same as Columbus's Santa Maria on the U.S. Colombian three cent. The ships are very similar, but as you can see from this slide, they are independent engravings. The flags and shading on the sails, for example, display clear differences. The engraving of the Santa Maria was based on a Spanish engraving. As the Cabot issue stamps ran out, they were replaced by a new definitive issue with portraits of members of the royal family. In 1897, three values were produced, again by the American Banknote Company. A half-cent olive with three-year-old Prince Edward, later King Edward VIII, a one-cent Carmen, Victoria, and a two-cent orange, Edward, Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII. In 1898, to conform with the Universal Postal Union Agreement on Colors, the one and two cent were reissued in new colors, the one cent in green and the two cent in vermilion. Also that year, the three cent with a portrait of Alexandra, the Princess of Wales, was introduced in orange. In 1899 came George, the Duke of York, later King George V, his first time on a stamp. And in 1901, Mary, the Duchess of York, completed the set. The two cent map issue of 1908 was unusual for being an issue of a single value, not part of a set. The story behind this stamp is just as unusual. Apparently, the SS Sylvia, sailing from New York and carrying a consignment of the current two-cent Prince of Wales stamp, shown on the left, sank off Massachusetts. To protect against revenue loss, should the sunken stamps fall into criminal hands, the Newfoundland government commissioned the American Banknote Company to engrave a replacement bearing a map of the island. In 1910, the Newfoundland government began a long run of stamp issues produced mostly by British companies. Rather than deal directly with the entity that produced the stamps, the government typically dealt with a procurement contractor, which in turn engaged a second company to produce the plates and print the stamps. The table in this slide lists the companies that produced each stamp issue. And you can see from it that Perkins Bacon, Delarue, and Waterloo were responsible for most of the issues. In 1910, 
the Newfoundland government issued an 11-stamp set commemorating the first, though unsuccessful, attempt at a permanent settlement on the island. John Guy was an alderman and later mayor of Bristol, England. With the help of Francis Bacon, he formed a company that secured a charter from King James I to establish a settlement. Guy sailed from Bristol on May 18, 1610, with three ships and 40 colonists. They settled at Cupid's on Conception Bay. Guy returned to England and brought more colonists to establish a branch colony at Mosquito, a few miles from Cupid's. Unfortunately, owing to infighting and strife with fishermen and pirates, the settlements were all but abandoned by 1628. The guy issue stamps that appeared in 1910 were lithographed. There were enough complaints about their printing quality that early in 1911 engraved versions of the 6 to 15 cent values were placed on sale. In this slide we show two values, the 12 cent and 15 cent, with the litho versions on the left and the engraved version on the right. Aside from being more vibrant in appearance, the engraved versions are slightly different colors from their predecessors. By the way, the 15 cent was a hasty add-on. While the issue was being prepared, King Edward VII died on May 6, 1910. So the 15 cent with the portrait of King George V as king was added. The coronation of King George V was marked by the Newfoundland government with a remarkable set of 11 stamps featuring 10 members of the royal family and the seal of Newfoundland. This is the only set we are going to show in its entirety because its production was split between two companies. The designs clearly show this. The 1 to 5 cent and 10 cent were the work of Delarue, and the 6, 8, 9, 12, and 15 cent were engraved by MacDonald and Sons. Most values were printed only one time. In this slide are five subjects from this set we'd like to particularly highlight. 1 cent Queen Mary, 2 cent King George V, 4 cent Prince Albert, later King George VI, 3 cent Edward, Prince of Wales, later King Edward VIII, and 10 cent the Dowager Queen Alexandra. The Trail of the Caribou issue commemorated the services of the Newfoundland contingent in World War I. The winning designs were by J. H. Noonan, an official in the Customs Department. One included a caribou head, and the other showed a moose head. Unable to settle on one of the designs, the government decided the stamp should show a composite animal with the head of a caribou and the antlers of a moose, a caramoose, an animal still being avidly sought on the island. The stamp set consisted of a single basic design with two subgroups, a group for the Newfoundland sailors with Royal Naval Reserve on the banner and Ubique above the cents, and a group for the Royal Newfoundland Regiment with Trail of the Caribou on the banner and the name of an engagement above the cents. Sova Bay was in Gallipoli in Turkey. All the other engagements were in France. Trail of the Caribou referred to the movements of the regiment because their badge bore a caribou head. The Trail of the Caribou issue was disliked because of the large size of the stamps. So the 14 value pictorial issue that followed went to the opposite extreme to become the smallest stamps the Dominion produced. All but one value shows scenic views, many along the 80-mile-long Humber River. Most of the scenes were from photographs by the island's noted photographer, Professor R. E. Holloway. 
Our examples in this slide include the two cent Southwest Arm Trinity, four cent a quiet nook Humber River, nine cent Caribou Crossing a Lake, eleven cent Shellbird Island, twelve cent Mount Moriah Bay of Islands, and fifteen cent Humber River near the Little Rapids. Newfoundland's long-standing dispute with Canada over control of the Labrador coast on the mainland was finally resolved by the British Privy Council in Newfoundland's favour in 1927. At that time, the island was also beginning a vigorous campaign to attract tourists. So a new 15-stamp set was issued. It featured a stamp with a Newfoundland Labrador map and it showed scenes, points of interest, etc. as a publicity tool. The engraving and printing work was carried out by Delarue. The new stamps appeared in 1928. Our examples here are 1 cent, a detailed map of the expanded Dominion of Newfoundland to include Labrador, 2 cent, the steamer SS Caribou a custom-built steamer owned by the Newfoundland Railway that plied between North Sydney, the eastern end of the C Canadian National Railway, and Port of Bass, the western terminus of the Newfoundland Railway, Nine Cent Cabot Tower on Signal Hill above St. John's where Marconi flew his kites and received the first radio message to cross the Atlantic, Six Cent Newfoundland Hotel in St. John's, 8 cent City of Heart's Content, nicknamed Cable City, where the first transatlantic cable was hooked up in 1866 and where most cables from Great Britain to Canada were relayed through its Western Union office, and 15 cent the Atlantic Vimy, taking off from St. John's for the first non-stop flight across the Atlantic in 1919. In 1929, the procurement contract for printing Newfoundland stamps passed to John Dickinson and Company of London. Fresh printings of some values of the Newfoundland Labrador issue were requested, but the former contractor, Whitehead Morrison Company, refused to give up the Delarue dies, rolls, and plates. So Dickinson, who were stationers, not engravers, hired Perkins Bacon and Company to copy 11 of the 15 values. The Perkins Bacon copies are close, but show numerous areas of differences. We've already discussed the two cent steamer differences in part one. Here we'll look at the 4 cent Prince of Wales and the 5 cent Express Train stamps. The Delarue originals are on the left and the Perkins Bacon copies are on the right. Even looking at the full stamps, it's not hard to see the difference in the rendering of Edward's features. Another clear point of difference is the circular ornaments on each side of the portrait. The Delarue design has six circles, and the Perkins Bacon design has five roses. On the trains, the difference is more subtle. For example, the Delarue issue lacks a spur around the upper left five ornament seen on the Perkins Bacon issue. We'll get into that with magnified shots soon to follow. Here's an enlarged view of the faces on the four cent stamps so you can more easily see the more true to life rendering on the Delarue original. And here are enlargements of the upper left five counter area on the express train designs. The arrows help you zero in on the differences. In 1931, the Newfoundland government requested that a Newfoundland coat of arms watermark be incorporated into the stamp paper. So a portion of the Perkins Bacon stamps come with the watermark. This table summarizes the occurrence of the three varieties of the Newfoundland Labrador stamps. 
Note that four values, the 9, 12, 14, and 28 cent, were not copied by Perkins Bacon, and that the 8 and 30 cent Perkins Bacon printings were only on watermark paper. At the beginning of 1932, a new pictorial stamp series appeared, consisting of 12 values. The royal family and Newfoundland scenes and animals were featured. Five examples are shown here. One cent, group of fish, one of the Dominion's greatest resources at that time. Two cent, King George V. Four cent, Edward, the Prince of Wales. Six cent, six-year-old Princess Elizabeth, later Queen Elizabeth II. And 14 cent, a Newfoundland dog. Late in 1932, due to changes in postal rates, three new values, 7 cent Queen Elizabeth, 8 cent Corner Brook Paper Mills, 24 cent Loading Iron Ore at Bell Island were added. Also, three color changes were made. 1 cent Dark Gray was green, 2 cent Green was red, and 4 cent Rose Lake was deep violet. The year 1933 was the 350th anniversary of the annexation of Newfoundland by Sir Humphrey Gilbert in 1583. The Newfoundland government marked the event with a 14 stamp set. Gilbert, half-brother of Sir Walter Raleigh, was an English adventurer and soldier. He was convinced of the existence of the Northwest Passage and in 1578 he secured a charter from Queen Elizabeth to search for it and claim land. In 1583 Gilbert sailed from Plymouth with five ships. One ship soon turned back but the other four arrived off the present site of St. John's on August 3, 1583. Only two ships later sailed for home, Sir Humphrey in the Squirrel and Captain Haynes in the Golden Hind. Sir Humphrey and his ship were lost in a storm off the Azores. The examples shown in this slide are 1 cent Sir Humphrey Gilbert, 8 cent Gilbert's fleet leaving Plymouth, 9 cent the fleet arriving at St. John's, and 24 cent Queen Elizabeth in 1934, the Newfoundland government became insolvent, and the Dominion was obliged to revert to Crown Colony status. As such, it issued the standard design omnibus sets for George V's Silver Jubilee, four values, and George VI's Coronation, three values. Because of Newfoundland's former Dominion status, the government could legally still issue its own stamps and it chose to issue a supplemental coronation set with 11 additional values. In generating the dies for the supplemental issue, Perkins Bacon relied heavily on their existing engravings for the 1932 pictorial issue. The one and three cent values were completely new, but all the other values had the vignette from the 1932 issue and a new section with George VI's portrait at the right. The 15 cent Northern Seal Pop stamp shows this nicely. The 1937 coronation issue was a one-time printing with the intention to return to the 1932 pictorial issue afterward. However, due to changes in the royal family, some values needed to be updated in 1938. The new stamps were 2 cent King George VI, 3 cent Queen Elizabeth, 4 cent an older, now 12 years old, Princess Elizabeth, and 7 cent the Dowager Queen Mary. And a new value, the 48 cent fishing fleet, was added at that time. In 1939, the King and Queen made the first ever visit of a reigning British monarch to their possessions in North America, including Newfoundland. A five-cent stamp marked the occasion. 
It was a one-time printing placed on sale on June 17th and withdrawn on July 31st, 1939. 1939 also saw the issue of the island's first postage due stamps, a set of six values unwatermarked. A watermarked version of the 10 cent appeared in 1949. In May 1941, a German bomber raid destroyed the Perkins Bacon printing plant. Newfoundland stamp printing was quickly transferred to Waterloo. The perforation changed from about 13.5 to 12.5. Most of the Perkins Bacon dies, rolls, and plates were saved from the rubble, but Waterloo had to do some touching up. And for the 2 cent and 3 cent, Waterloo made completely fresh engravings. In this slide, we see the Perkins Bacon original on the left and the Waterloo replacement 2 cent on the right. Note the difference in the lower right of the L of Newfoundland. Here's a closer view of the 2 cent stamps in which one can see that the rendering of George VI's portraits is more lifelike on the Perkins Bacon original than the Waterloo copy. Another point of difference is the crown band. On the Waterloo version, the jewels are larger. The three cent was also copied. As with the two cent, the Perkins Bacon original has a long serif on the L in Newfoundland. And as with the two cent, the queen's face is more true to life on the Perkins Bacon version and the jewels on the crown band are larger on the Waterloo version. Meanwhile, new commemorative stamps were being issued. The first was a five cent stamp in 1941 to recognize the medical missionary Sir Wilfred Grenfell and the work of the Grenfell mission in Labrador. In 1943 came a 30 cent stamp for St. John's newly renamed Memorial University College. The new name recognized all the Newfoundlanders killed in wartime. Finally came two 1947 issues, an updated four cent stamp in the 1932 to 38 pictorial series showing 21 year old Princess Elizabeth and a commemorative marking the 450th anniversary of the arrival of Cabot off Cape Bonavista in 1497. In the Newfoundland Surface Mail series, provisional issues were those for which the value or the use was changed compared to the original stamps from which they came. Provisionals first arose with the 1857-61 pence issue and persisted well into the 20th century. The first type of provisional we'll note here is the bisect. A bisect was sometimes used when there was a lack of a particular value, but there was available the stamp of double the value. So the stamp was cut in half and the partial stamp used to pay half the rate of the complete stamp. Our example here is a cover with an eight penny stamp of the 1857 pence issue cut in half to pay four pence. By far the most common type of provisional is where a stamp of one value is overprinted to change its value. Our example here is a three cent stamp of 1890 overprinted to make it a one cent stamp. Value change provisionals were produced right up into the 1940s. In 1933, a most unusual kind of provisional arose. 15 cent airmail stamps were overprinted with bars to cross out airmail, and L and S post for land and sea post overprinted to convert them from airmail to surface mail stamps. When sun rays crown thy pie This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Spreads her hand when silver.